Now, instead of, uh, of uh, leading to a surprise conclusion on the 31st of October, uh, where the happy answer to what is the nature and meaning and purpose of love is, again, I'm going to answer that question in a few minutes. Uh, because that sets, and it's answered, I might add, in the first four verses of, of, uh, of John. So he sets it out there as well. Um, first, though, I have a basic question and a couple more. First is this basic question. Where is love found? For those of you who remember, remember should I sing it? I found love on a two-way street, remember that? But lost it on a lonely highway. It's a beautiful song. So you don't find, remember that? Want me to sing it? <laughs> this is a church dude. <laughs> I found love on a two-way street. And lost it on a lonely highway. <laughs> so love isn't found on a two-way street if it isn't lost on a highway, a lonely highway. Where is love found? Okay. That was pretty good. <laughs> Once you found that love, how do you secure it? How do you unite with it? How do you become one with that? So where is love found? How does one unite with that love? And now underlying these two questions, as I hinted at earlier, is also yet again another question in this. How is union with Jesus Christ, and therefore union with God, realized? After all, God is love. So to discover the nature and purpose of love, one has to discover God. And one discovers God by finding out who Jesus is. So if you find out who Jesus is and become one with Jesus, that means then, obviously, you become one with God. And if you become one with God, then you become one with love. So you know what love is. That becomes part of your life. Okay? <coughs> it's real simple. You find love in God. You find love through Jesus Christ. If you want to find and understand what love is, experience love, it's nature and purpose, then you have to become one with Jesus Christ and God, and therefore with love. And there your answer is discovered. Real simple. So to answer these questions, each inter, uh, intertwined and inseparable, we now turn to the epistle called 1 John. Now John's answer to these primary questions that I have raised, what is the nature of God? What is the purpose of love? How do you define God? Or how do you find love? Where do you discover love? How do you get to love? All that kind of stuff. What John is able to do is he figures it out. And he figures it out, and he does so because there's some goofy stuff that's going on in the congregation that he ends up writing regarding the nature and purpose of love and, and, and how we discover it. Anyway. With that said, John's answer is this. We discover or find union with God in Christ, and by this is meant the nature and purpose of love, in only one place. And this is where people get confused, and they say, no, 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 I'll grant you Christians this, but I've found love in other places, and blah, blah, blah. Now, fine, I'm not here to argue that with anybody. I'm here to say, According to John, that's not true. He says it's found only, underscore the word only, in one place. And that place is in fellowship. It's the only place it's found. It is not found outside of fellowship. <coughs> At least for John. Now, by fellowship, uh, you, those of you who are a little, you know, probably older than 40, grew up with this word koinonia, remember? Uh, that koinonia, where is the koinonia or fellowship found? Um, koinonia is the Greek of it. And John says that you find koinonia in the local congregation. That's 
That's where you find love. And in the local congregation, you find love. Okay, now I'm going to show you how this works. And again, I'm not asking anybody to believe it um, because I say so. Um, the local congregation is the church, right? And that's the local church, all right? Now follow me. Uh, the body, the very body of Jesus Christ is called what? The church. The church. So the church is the body of Jesus Christ. Now this is very important as you're going to see later on. The body of Jesus Christ, in, in kind of a perverse way, is not disembodied. Jesus Christ is not floating around out there. The body of Jesus Christ is here, present in the fellowship. So if you can become one with the fellowship, you become one with Jesus, you become one with God, you become one with love, and you understand what love is. You understand its nature, you understand its purpose. Now, why does John say this? What has provoked him to write this letter and send it off to churches in Asia Minor? Here's the answer. In Asia Minor, that's Turkey. In particular, we're talking about Western Turkey, uh, around Ephesus in that area, probably, which is, um, yeah, you're looking at me this side of Turkey. In Asia Minor, there were so-called Christian leaders, or there were leaders who once were leaders in particular churches, who deemed that union with God and Christ and the experience of divine love could be experienced or celebrated or enjoyed or encountered outside of the local congregation or fellowship. By this is meant one can discover what divine love is on one's own with having nothing to do with the fellowship. You understand that? I'm not asking you to believe it. I'm just saying that's what John is saying. <clears throat> Now, exactly how they consider this possible, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that in subsequent um, sermons in the next uh, four weeks. Suffice it to say, John, and this is, this is what's important, personally, <coughs> and by personally, he means physically, not intellectually. He means physically, historically, truly, really, experientially. He knows uh, this ideation that love could be experienced outside of the fellowship, divine love. He knew that that was not only in error, worse yet, it's a lie. Now, this is an important word. Who is the author of lies? Satan. So, so John says, and you'll understand this, those of you who believe, not you, those who believe that divine love can be experienced outside of the fellowship are liars, and that means they're in league with Satan. And people go, I've experienced love outside of the church. I don't know why David and John are saying this. Well, you'll understand this uh, in week four. You will, I hope. Consequently, John writes to reaffirm the historical or authentic foundations of a personal love and life with God and Christ, as opposed to the philosophical expectations and speculations in Asia Minor that were being proffered as divine truth. John seeks passion <coughs> to present a correct view. Ah, you go to your glossary, that's orthodoxy. The correct view and of, of what love is, and bases his letter on what for him is personal, historical, empirical, readily available truth. John is not a speculative theologian. He, when he's talking about love, and this is what's important, he is talking about love from an experiential point of view that he knows personally. He hasn't sat around and thought about love. What is love? He does, he's not interested in that kind of nonsense. He says that's nonsensical to sit around and talk about what you think love is because he knows what love, love is. So John is not musing 
about love and God. Rather, he knows what he's talking about because he has experienced it historically. And that's very important. I wish I could find a word or words that, that could, could perhaps um, convince people more of what I know is true on this. But, but be that as it may, what we'll have to do is um, just go with John. Now, I want to read something. This is now what you have to understand is when John uses these words, these are sensual words that is having to do with the senses touch, feel, taste. Okay? So they're not speculation, these words. They're real. That's important. Now, watch me. You have a group of people over here in Asia Minor <coughs> who are ideating, who are thinking about, it, who are speculating what love is, and how we get to this divine union, with me, with God. And if you get to this divine union with God, then you'll experience divine love, and everything will be hunky-dory. We have people today who do that. Now, and that's based on speculation, philosophy. The way I feel inside. I feel love, okay? Well, never forget Jimmy Jones felt love. <coughs> never forget Jimmy Jones felt love. Never forget Hitler loved. Hitler had all sorts of feelings of love for Eva. Now, that's not the kind of love I want. So if, so if that's your understanding of love being a feeling, then we, we got, we're going to have problems with that. You know? I have a real problem with that. Okay? Brett Favre has a different understanding of what love is. You know? Because his idea of love is based on feelings. My idea of love is based on commandment to obey what God commands me to do and the relationship that I am ordered by God to have with my wife. And that has nothing to do with feelings. Absolutely nothing to do with feelings. Now, watch this, and then I'll get us out of here. We're going to have food in a minute. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, and he's talking about Jesus, we have heard Jesus. We have seen Jesus. We have looked on Jesus. We have touched Jesus. This we proclaim to you. What we know historically, factually, empirically true has nothing to do with our ideations or our feelings. This has to do with what we know is true. And it's called the word of life. And the life Jesus appeared. Now appeared, they mean historically. They don't mean that he appeared in a dream or there's this <coughs> phantom floating around. Oh, I have the spirit of Jesus in me. He doesn't use that kind of goofy language. He's not interested in the spirit of Jesus and the love of Jesus. We have seen it. We speak of it. We proclaim it to you. And we proclaim to you that which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim it to you because we have seen it. We have heard it. And we're telling you this so that you may also have fellowship koinonia with us. And if you have fellowship with us, in other words, the local church, then you'll have fellowship with whom, Swale? Jesus. Jesus and God. 